So the Obama administration sends their top gun on criminal justice reform up to Capitol Hill so they could explain to the hicks up there who haven't yet quite caught up with the message that black people are relentless victims of relentless white racism all the time, everywhere. That explains everything, especially why cops are always picking on black people, especially why black people are always going to jail for no reason whatsoever. She was doing just fine until she ran into that buzzsaw by the name of Trey Gowdy. So let's get that little back and forth going. And when we do, uh, they got into something we really like around here to talk about witness intimidation. Why don't, while they talk, why don't I put up a few clips of some recent witness intimidation stories? You're not going to want to miss this. And you were not able to address other cases. I wanted to ask you whether or not you were familiar with, with a few other cases Sandy Rogers and Scotty Richardson from Aiken, South Carolina. Are you familiar with that case? No, sir. Uh, how about Roger Dale Rice from Lauren, South Carolina? Are you familiar with that case? No, sir. Eric Nicholson or Marcus Whitfield from Greenville, South Carolina? Are you familiar with that case? No, sir. Russ Sorrow from Greenville, South Carolina? No, sir. Or Kevin Carper from Spartanburg, South Carolina? No, sir. Uh, professor, those are just a handful of the more than 340 police officers who were killed in the line of duty in South Carolina. And Kevin Carper's case is most instructive because his partner did CPR on the suspect that killed Kevin, trying to save his life. Uh, let me ask it another way. Are you familiar with the case of Ricky Samuel? No, sir. Um, How about Tamika Houston? No, sir. How about Nell Lindsay? No, sir. Miranda All? No, sir. Santiago Rios? No, sir. Those are all folks that were the victim of intra-racial homicides in South Carolina. And I hasten to add, there were not protests either with any of those police officer killings or any of the intra racial killings. And I suspect you agree with me, Professor, that all lives matter, whether you're killed by a police officer or your next door neighbor, you're every bit as dead, aren't you? Yes, sir. Um, right. I actually, as a former prosecutor and someone who's worked with police officers, have the deepest respect for them. Uh, so, do, so do I. And despite that deep respect, Professor, um, I still maintain the objectivity of prosecuting police officers who engaged in misconduct. We have a process in place, if you don't think you can be fair. It's called recusal, which is what some of us did in every single one of our officer-involved shootings. We recused it to another prosecutor so he or she could make that decision. So there is a process in place. You called for a process. There is one. It's called recusal. Do you know, as a former prosecutor, or can you deign what may have been the biggest impediment to our being able to successfully prosecute homicide cases, particularly homicide cases involving victims of color in my criminal justice jurisdiction. Do you know what the biggest impediment was? In Massachusetts, one of the biggest impediments is trying to get witnesses to come forward. You're exactly right. You're exactly right. You have a victim of color, and we had trouble getting witnesses to cooperate with law enforcement and prosecutors, which then, as you know, diminishes the quality of that case and your ability to prosecute it, which may result in a lesser plea bargain because you don't have the facts, which may then result in what you said in your opening statement, which is people have a tendency to treat black lives differently than white, when the reality is the case wasn't quite as good. Isn't that a possibility? Too? It, for every prosecutor um, who's out there, this is a serious problem, and you are correct in pointing that out, sir. Right, and it, and, and it wasn't just me pointing it out, Professor. Um, I happen to have a fantastic chief of police when I was the DA, fantastic man by the name of Tony Fisher, who happened to be an African-American chief of police, and he lamented the exact same thing you and I are talking about is the loss of life in his community and the refusal of people to cooperate, even in a drive-by shooting of an eight-year-old at a birthday party, a drive-by shooting outdoors where the whole world saw the car drive by. 
and nobody would cooperate with the prosecution in, a, in, in the murder of an eight-year-old. So I hope that part of this 21st century police strategies conversation that we're having includes getting people to cooperate with law enforcement so you can hold people to the exact same standard regardless of the race of the victim. Because let me tell you what my goal is. My goal is for witnesses to feel comfortable cooperating. But here's my other goal, and I'm out of time, but I'm going to share it with you. I want us to get to the point where we lament the death the murder of a black female like Nell Lindsay, just as much if it's at the hand of an abusive husband, which it was, as we would if it had been at the hand of a white cop. I'd like to get to the point where we're equally outraged at the loss of life. I may be misjudging the good gentleman from South Carolina, Congressman Gowdy, but I really think he just might have made the black kids angry. <laughs>